So new Pokemon Snap is a thing. It's Pokemon and photography and it's new in case you were confusing with the old Pokemon Snap, which is just called Pokemon Snap. But either way, Pokemon Snap is a thing and it's back and man, am I glad to see it. Welcome back. I fucking loved Pokemon. I still do. I have friends that also regularly buy the newest games so we can battle and trade. We talk Pokemon ad nauseum. I even dabble in the card game a bit just for fun. For me, the real pleasure of Pokemon has always been in the adventure. Pokemon has always been a social game due to the nature of the link cable requiring another person to catch them all, but I tend to ignore that. I'm not super interested in catching every single Pokemon. I want to go out and find neat Pokemon and see what the world has to offer, explore new terrain and environments, and discover new Pokemon while battling the strongest trainers as I grow closer with my Pokemon. So when the original Pokemon Snap came out, I kinda didn't get it at all. You don't capture them, you don't even get Pokeballs, you just take photos? Then how do I beat game? But then I tried it and it was awesome! Who knew taking pictures could be so much fun? This was long before Instagram. So I beat the game, and that same year Pokemon Gold and Silver came out, and I was ready to return to Pokemon Snap with these new Pokemon. And then Generation 3 went by. And then Gen 4. Gen 6. Generation 8. And it looked like there would never be another Pokemon Snap. And then, almost 22 years later, the clouds parted, and a shiny new trailer dropped. This wasn't a remake, or a redo, or even a port. This wasn't the old Pokemon Snap at all. This was new Pokemon Snap and I couldn't wait to play it. Look how beautiful it is, all shiny and anime and 3D with Pokemon from every generation and a new region and story. It was the return of that fun gameplay style that's just the right mix of charming and relaxing while still being engaging. But as I was playing through the new Pokemon Snap, something kept bothering me. Not about this game, but about Pokemon in general and how this game changed the way I was interacting with Pokemon. For me, there was an ongoing problem with Pokemon, and it's not the fact that the newer games are too easy, or the fact that not all Pokemon were included, or the lack of story. No, this has more to do with the Pokemon themselves, and how we choose to engage and play with them from a design standpoint. And so today, I want to talk about new Pokemon Snap. For those of you who were born after 2000, which according to my channel analytics, or channelytics, is a lot of you, the original Pokemon Snap was released in 1999 during the height of the original Pokemon craze. The Pokemon Company, which used to be called Game Freak, couldn't make Pokemon products fast enough for the public to get their greedy, sticky hands on. And remember, this was before Pokemon was the single largest money-making intellectual property in the world. Suck it, Disney! Game Freak and Nintendo capitalized on this craze by trying some really bizarre innovations, such as Pokemon Stadium, Pokemon Puzzle, Pokemon Pinball, and then someone thought, wouldn't taking pictures be a cool idea? Which, if you're like me, you'd probably think, no, no it doesn't. But Nintendo partnered with HAL Laboratory, the people behind Kirby and Smash Bros, to make Pokemon Snap. Despite being from the era where 3D graphics were all shiny and new, and by that I mean janky as fuck, Pokemon Snap created a really unique and visually impressive 3D world inhabited with all kinds of Pokemon to see and study, all in the pursuit of the best photograph. New Pokemon Snap was developed by Bandai Namco Studios, and features mostly the same gameplay and objectives as the original, but with more Pokemon and less sharp edges. They're basically on-rail shooters, the biggest difference being that you take pictures of the targets rather than shooting them. Or typing at them? All the while you're trying to explore the area for new routes or clues to solve the... mystery. Okay, so like most Pokemon games, the story is not exactly brilliant. Spoiler warning for what little spoilers there are in these games, but hey, maybe you want to go back and play the first one or you haven't played the new one yet. The first game sees a young Pokemon photographer named Todd Snap. Wait, seriously? That's his actual fucking name in English. Todd gets a call from Professor Oak asking him to come to a place called the Pokemon Island. Pokemon Island? Did they even try with these names? Todd takes pictures of Pokemon and their behavior to help Professor Oak. That's all there is to it. The second game sees the player take control of their own unique avatar and travel to the brand new Lentil region for some kind of unpaid internship to Professor Mirror at the Laboratory of Ecological and Nature Sciences, or LENS for short, which in contrast to the first game is great wordplay. You help research Pokemon behavior aided by the professor's other unpaid intern, Rita, and some other kid named Phil. And Todd even shows up, but he's looking a lot less angular than I remember. Anyway, these characters help you research a unique feature for the region called the Illumina Phenomena, where Pokemon glow. Because there's a meteor? I don't know. 
And in both games, you huck stuff at Pokemon in an effort to see various kinds of behavior, or even get them to interact with the environment or each other so you can catalog it in photo form. The professor then rates your photos using a questionable evaluation system. What about photo composition? Or framing? Texture? Color contrast? I know this is for science, but where's the artistry? Besides my thoughts on photography, the games are relaxing and provide a good amount of fun and challenge in a way that's very different from the mainline Pokemon games. Of course, it's nice when games don't have to rely on fighting or competition with others to be fun. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but trying to compete with oneself or complete the photo decks or the story without needing to resort to anything more than pegging a Swampert in the head with a fruit as an act of violence does make for innovative gameplay, which is a great way to engineer new gaming mechanics. But what makes the new and old Pokemon Snap games interesting is the way the player interacts with Pokemon. Specifically, how that interaction differs from the mainline games. I have always enjoyed the mainline games as a way to explore new regions and find new and interesting Pokémon to battle with. Pokémon Snap lets me see even more environments, now in glorious 3D, and inhabits them with vibrant Pokémon. But instead of being preoccupied with catching and then fighting with them, the game forces you to take the time to observe these Pokémon. In the newer game, you need to collect photos of four different kinds of behavior for each Pokemon. This means multiple passes through a level as you observe and consider both the Pokemon and which object to huck at it. This takes time. Each track is only about five minutes long and no one Pokemon is visible for the whole track. On top of that, your position in relation to the Pokemon matters. You have to pay attention to the direction and proximity of the Pokemon in order to get better scores. To do well, you are forced to recognize details of each individual Pokemon, of which there are over 200 in the game. Contrast this with the mainline titles, where you spend time with likely only a handful of Pokémon as you build out the team you're going to use to defeat the gym leaders and ultimately the Elite Four. This comes down to two different design elements in the Pokémon themselves and the way these affect gameplay. Both the mainline titles and the Pokémon Snap games complement Pokémon, but Pokémon Snap really shouldn't be seen as a side game, and this has to do with the way we play with Pokémon as toys. Wait a second. Pokémon aren't toys. They're digital fictional creatures in a video game. True, but they are also real-world plushies and figurines that can be collected. On top of that, in the games they are presented to the player in a toy-like fashion and are engaged with in a state of play. Both gameplay, but also traditional toy play. And I'm not talking about sex toys! Pokémon are hybrid virtual toys. In this case, hybrid means that they are both real-world and digital, but I think that there is another layer to this regarding the dichotomy of aesthetic design and utilitarian design. Utilitarian design has to do with the way Pokémon are built in terms of their utility, so not the ethics of utilitarianism, but the way they're utilized. Anyone who's played a mainline Pokémon game should be familiar with the way battling works. Like any RPG, a character's abilities are based on statistics, or stats for short. Basically, in order for the game to determine whether or not you can do something, it has to define inherently indefinable things. So, it does this with numbers. Apart from having type advantage in Pokémon, which is basically just a slightly more advanced version of rock, paper, scissors, Pokémon also have stats. And as a Pokémon levels up, its stats go up so that your team grows. It's capable of defeating more powerful foes who also have higher stats. This is great in theory, but there's a problem. Not all Pokémon have equal stats. Whoa, that sounds like some Animal Farm shit, but let me explain. Pokémon games have a great hook. Obviously, the incentive is gotta catch them all. But the other more pressing and probably more feasible goal is to defeat the Elite Four and become the champion. That means you're going to need to put together a team of various types. So you train your team up and you get to the later gyms, but you find one Pokémon in your team is just not cutting it. It's the same or higher level as the others on your team, but it's just not winning and so you check its stats against the others and they don't compare. So, you pick another Pokémon to fill that type matchup to round out your team. This is even more noticeable if you've ever seen competitive Pokémon. I won't even pretend to understand competitive battling, but there are like tiers for which Pokémon are allowed and moveset strategies. Breeding is a huge part because you have to get the right nature for your Pokémon to affect its growth and pay attention to EVs and IVs. And if these were real animals, I would probably say this is bordering on eugenics, but they're games, so whatever. The whole thing is overly utilitarian in my opinion. It's primarily concerned with the Pokémon stats and optimizing or min-maxing them for competitive battling. The people that get into this are dedicated and admirable in how they break down play-by-plays, movesets, and strategies. It's really complex and totally worth checking out even just to see a different side of Pokémon. But it's not for me, because it feels like the antithesis of going on an adventure and learning to love Pokémon. Plus, I'm not a hard mode person, and the Pokémon games are far more forgiving than competitive opponents. But, and this is important, they still punish players for using a Pokémon with low or bad stats. 
But the games constantly tell us that all Pokemon are equal. So which is it? Are we supposed to love every Pokemon equally, but then lose because you tried to beat the Elite Four with a fucking Beedrill? We're told that all Pokemon are valuable, but some Pokemon are just more valuable because they actually win. And through reinforcement, both negative and positive, it becomes obvious which Pokemon to choose. This results in a dilemma for some players. What do you do if your favorite Pokemon has low stats? Like, Pikachu is the mascot for Pokemon, but outside of that special Pikachu from Pokemon Yellow, its stats are not great. I'm lucky. One of my favorites is Jolteon, and it always kicks ass for me in the games, but if I tried to battle competitively with it, I'd get laughed at. But collecting Pokemon is the other part of the games, right? Sure, yeah, collect them all, but the ones you grow with and build a team with had better be feasible in battle. No one's gonna build a team with a Molgo or a fucking dead end. Like, great, I caught you. Now go to the box where I can peer at you at my leisure as one of almost 900 Pokemon in my collection. This leads to the second problem with this utilitarian line of thinking about Pokemon with regards to aesthetic design. Cute Pokemon are weak. Now, there are some notable exceptions to this rule, such as Primarina, but on the whole, Pokemon with poor stats tend to be small and cute, and Pokemon with good stats tend to be bigger and look more menacing. One of the main features of Pokemon is the fact that they evolve, and even this causes Pokemon to shed their cuter aesthetics for more impressive and intimidating looks. Most of the starter Pokemon do this. Look at Torchic, super cute, and then it evolves into... Well, that's just a penis. Look at Piplup. It's super cute and then it evolves into Prinplup. Bigger and a little bit more grown up. That awkward puberty phase, but still a little less cute. But then Empoleon. Regal. Imposing. Powerful. I can understand why this is the case. We see this phenomenon in the biology of the real world, with larger animals being less cute. This has to do with our perception of cuteness as mammals. It makes sense, and I'm not saying it's bad, but it means that if you're into cute Pokemon, Good luck trying to have good stats. You might be okay for the first part of the game, but eventually you'll be forced to make some substitutes to your team if you want to progress. So cute Pokemon are left to the wayside in the storage box, or need to be evolved into more menacing or imposing figures, like Blastoise or Abomasnow. Aesthetic design is a huge factor in how players choose their toys, but if the design is superseded by stats, then the only reason to put up with cute Larvitar and the frankly weird Pupitar is to get the awesome Tyranitar, which looks badass, so no complaints, but Larvitar and Pupitar are now only a means to an end, and if you liked the cute Larvitar, then, well, you're out of luck, because now it looks like it's taken steroids. But Pokemon Snap doesn't have battling. Both games change the way we as players value the utility and aesthetics of Pokemon by putting more emphasis on the aesthetic choices of playing with these digital toys. In Pokemon Snap, the stats of Pokemon for the purposes of battling are non-existent. Instead, the game is about waiting and watching each Pokemon for new and unique behavior. Looking at the design elements and really appreciating the way Pokemon are crafted aesthetically and marveling at the programming behind how these Pokemon behave. And this makes each and every Pokemon matter in a way that the mainline games just cannot achieve. Oh, they tried! In third and fourth generation, they introduced Pokemon competitions, but I don't actually know how to do those. Ser seriously, did anyone actually figure out how to do those? New Pokemon Snap even includes a personal photo album so you can save your favorite photos that maybe aren't the highest scoring. You can even share these online with friends. In terms of play, audiences can choose the toy they prefer based on the aesthetic design of that Pokemon, which is hugely important for how toys are marketed, but more important to how they are enjoyed and played with. This includes hybrid virtual toys. One of my favorite Pokemon designs is Skarmory. It's this badass, huge, fuck-off armored bird with, like, razor-sharp wings. That sounds sick, but its stats and movesets are just not great. So I catch it, and then it inevitably goes off to the box to its proverbial death. But in Pokemon Snap, Skarmory flies around like a fucking jet plane, all metal and gleaming and shit? Now that's badass! I fucking choose you, every time! Pokemon Snap highlights aesthetic value, but it also inverts this. By virtue of being larger in scale, bigger Pokemon are easier to spot and therefore take pictures of. And you're scored on how large a Pokemon is in the frame, so big Pokemon like Wailord or Mamoswine are not just easy to get high scoring photos of, but really kind of hard to miss. This means smaller Pokemon, which are often cuter, are now the harder Pokemon to get shots of. The difficulty and complexity of good shots of these Pokemon that used to be seen as less valuable in the mainline games are now the ones that have a higher degree of prestige when you get a high scoring photo. Especially for more difficult behaviors, because they move around and are fast and you have to follow them and you just sit still you stupid rabbit!
By placing a larger emphasis on the visual design, these games have liberated Pokemon from a purely utilitarian choice for audiences in how they choose to play with Pokemon as hybrid virtual toys. In a game about taking photos, Pokemon are treated equally because their value is simply in their interactions and visual appeal to the player. Larger Pokemon may be easier to get shots of, but they're still awe-inspiring and impressive, and the cute smaller Pokemon are adorable! Plus, these two kinds of Pokemon interact so you can choose whichever or both. You still have to collect them all, but instead of selecting six with high stats, you get to choose the ones you like simply because of how they look or act, and that is important in the selection and preference in toys, even if they are only digital rather than plush or plastic. And that is why I think Pokemon Snap is a really creative and charming game that changes and complements the game design of the mainline titles and the aesthetic choices of Pokemon overall. Here are my stray thoughts. I love relaxing by playing these games, and as much as I love the thrill of winning a Pokemon battle, it's nice to just take photos on the beach at sunset. I love the volcano level the most because the first time I went through it, I got roared at by a Tyrantrum, and that is extremely close to how I imagine going on a ride at Jurassic Park would be like. I don't have much to say about the story. I guess the best way to describe it would be like any other Pokemon game. There was a story. I know I poked some fun at the first Pokemon Snap for being 3D, but it really was quite revolutionary. Plus, I can be 3D. Watch. Whoa, that is nightmarish. Let's never do that again. Hey, thanks so much for watching that video. Make sure to snap that like button and don't forget to subscribe. I'd love to hear which is your favorite Pokemon or your thoughts in general about Pokemon Snap and just Pokemon. I just love talking about Pokemon. Make sure to stick around for lots of cool episodes of our weekly podcast, more episodes of This Is A Thing, and the long and the short of it. Plus whatever else we got cooking up right here on Cinemaster's Ultimate Timeline.